TorahCafe.com. We've learned a lot about uh, Viktor Frankl, his book, The Man's Search for Meaning, his psychology, his philosophy. I'm going to be speaking more now about the therapeutic applications of logotherapy. And I, I speak as a licensed marriage and family therapist. And over the years, I've tried to bring down Frankl's work and logotherapy work into my practice. I want to describe how you could utilize uh, logotherapy as an individual, or if you're a therapist, uh, you could bring this into your therapeutic uh, process with your clients. The main point which we're going to be discussing today is what Frankel called the existential vacuum. Frankel noted over 60, 70 years ago that the neuroses which man suffered from up and to around the period of the Second World War were very different from the world of Frankel and the rest of the 20th century. He believed that what man was facing, the new neuroses, was what he called this great existential vacuum, um, what could also be described as a deep sense of meaninglessness. And Frankel believed that when people experience that deep sense of meaninglessness, they go on to fill in that vacuum with all types of distractions. So, for example, Freud talked about you know, the will to pleasure. And Adler talked about the will towards money, will to power. Frankl said that those things, however, only come in to fill in the existential vacuum when there's something lacking in a person's life. What a person really wants deep down inside is what Frankl called his will to meaning. People are looking for a deep sense of meaning in their lives. They want to know why things happen and what they should do with their lives to respond to that. So Frankl's psychology is all about filling in that deep chasm of the existential vacuum. And we know that there are many things in the modern world that people utilize to fill in that existential vacuum as well. Today's conference, for example, we're talking about applying Viktor Frankl's theories to addiction. And we know that things like alcohol, for many people, are utilized to fill in that existential vacuum. Internet, cell phones, everybody's on their phones today. You know, one of the main things I do as a marriage therapist is try to get people off their cell phones when they walk in the door and they're greeting their spouse or sitting at dinner or even into the evening to turn off their cell phones. It's a tremendous addiction. It's as if that cell phone giving us so much enjoyment, news, communication, videos, whatever, is somehow filling in a deeper sense, uh, a lack of meaning in their lives. Violence. Look at how people um, enjoy violent sports or watching violent sports. Uh, people boxing or other sports where there's tremendous painful contact. And, and so often that is also filling in what we would call this existential vacuum. vacuum. And of course, drug, drug addiction. Um, we have a plague today of heroin addiction in America. Uh, people are ODing from heroin and uh, the tremendous use of marijuana in our society. I had a young man come to me recently who said to me, um, you know, marijuana is not a drug. And I said, well, you know, yes, it is. He says, no, no, it's not. And now I realize we're not really debating on a scientific level. If you open up Google or Wikipedia, of course, marijuana is a drug. But for this young man, marijuana had become part of a, a popular culture. And it was used just like alcohol was used maybe 30, 40 years ago. Today, marijuana was like just smoking a cigarette. And therefore, what we're dealing with is a deepening of the existential vacuum, where like drugs like pot or heroin are just coming to fill in a deeper uh, lack of meaning in people's lives. It's interesting to note, I know we're talking about Viktor Frankl, but Carl Jung, another great psychiatrist of the earliest, earlier part of the 20th century, um, he was actually corresponding with the Alcoholics Anonymous movement. And I believe in 1935, he penned a letter back to one of the founders of AA, and he quoted a line, he said, Spiritus contra spiritum. It turns out that the word for alcohol or wine is also spirit in Latin. And the same word also means spirituality. Spirit, you know, you go to a wine store, it says alcohol and wine and spirits. So 
Jung was pointing out that the word spirit is also the, so the source of the word spirituality, the root of the word spirituality. So he said sometimes that alcohol is there to replace, so to speak, a deeper sense of spirituality. He believed that um, a person who becomes an alcoholic is really longing for and yearning for a deep sense of spirituality that he or she can't find in this world. He doesn't have the tools to find it. So he goes towards a lower pleasure, more base pleasure, which is that of alcohol and a greater experience of meaninglessness. Um, as Carl Jung quotes, the equivalent on a low level of the spiritual thirst of our being for wholeness, expressed in medieval language, the union with God. So behind the, the deep uh, existential vacuum is a deeper longing for getting close to God as well, as this next video tells us. The patients who came to consult Jung at his house in Kusnacht varied widely, from American heiresses and the German writer Hermann Hesse to the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. Dr. Jeffrey Satinover. Basically, the motive for starting Alcoholics Anonymous came out of a patient of Jung's experience. And Jung's communicating to that patient the idea that essentially he was not going to ever successfully get over his alcoholism if he did not find God. The official history of Alcoholics Anonymous traces the group's origins to Jung's diagnosis of the incurable alcoholic known only as Roland H. His craving for alcohol was the equivalent on a low level of the spiritual thirst of our being for wholeness, expressed in medieval language, the union with God. What people seek in addictive experience is something which in and of itself is normal. That, that is to say, the craving is normal. The craving for certain kinds of elation, for a certain sense of specialness, for heroism, for cessation of pain, and underlying all of those really ultimately and, and most powerful, is the uh, seeking of a sense of meaningfulness. And you've just noted this psychiatrist says what's really lacking in a person's inner being when they're suffering addiction is this deep sense of meaning in their lives, exactly what Viktor Frankl is talking about. And it's really no accident today that there's so many uh, Alcoholics Anonymous associated groups today. There's so much addiction in our society. It's just prevalent. Go onto the internet and search AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, or Alcoholics Anonymous related groups. There's literally hundreds, perhaps thousands. AA, there's Cocaine Anonymous, Dual Recovery Anonymous, Marijuana Anonymous, uh, Al-Anon Family Groups, Overeaters Anonymous, Gamblers Anonymous, Adult Children of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. The list goes on and on. And I believe it's just pointing out to the fact that there's a tremendous existential vacuum, a uh, deep sense of meaninglessness. And, you know, the plethora of, of the Internet today, why it's in every aspect of our lives, we're constantly plugged in, we're looking for news every, every few seconds. I think, again, that just points to the fact that we're experiencing more meaninglessness. So uh, it's being filled in with more distractions. That's one side of the impact of meaninglessness on addiction. The other side is, is mental health. Um, according to national statistics, 45 million Americans suffer from um, anxiety, anxiety disorders. Over 15 million Americans suffer from depression and depressive symptoms. Now, according to logotherapists, 20% uh, of all uh, depressions and anxieties are what, what Franklin would call uh, neurological neuroses, meaning neuroses based upon the lack of meaning. One in five clients or people that suffer from either depression, we're talking about 60 million people if we combine both depression and anxiety together. One in five Americans uh, uh, out of that group are experiencing that depression and anxiety from a uh, deep lack of meaning. They, don't, they just don't have a purpose in their lives. We also see this in, in marriage counseling, which I do a lot of, that many couples uh, that have come to me and just exist in the world, those who are suffering, I would say also about one in five couples or 20% of the couples, their marriages are suffering not because one person is addicted or one person's abusive, but because either in the individuals or both of the, of the individuals don't understand the meaning of the marriage. You know, uh, the marriage is a hard thing to, to work towards, to, to keep together, to work towards shalom bias. 
only when you have a greater meaning in your marriage can you be successful in those areas. If I know the purpose of marriage is to achieve attachment or bonding, and in order to achieve that and to maintain that, one has to sacrifice a lot of things with their lives. You can't do what you always want to do at the, at the moment. You have to give to others, even if it's difficult. But that can only happen when you have a greater sense of meaning. So about 20% of the couples I see are also suffering in their marriages because they don't know what the purpose of their marriage actually is. And that is unfortunately why in the United States today we have a divorce rate hovering perhaps around, in and around 50%, also pointing to a great lack of meaning in people's lives or in couples' lives. And of course, it's not just marriage or depression and anxiety. It's almost any kind of disorder that um, we are treating as uh, psychologists today. Some of my training were things in like cognitive behavioral therapy by Aaron Beck, and that's where we kind of look into people's thoughts about the world or cognitions about themselves. EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, another very popular um, therapy which I have trained in and practiced with people, helping them overcome post-traumatic stress disorder, or even uh, attachment theory and uh, emotionally focused couple therapy, which I've been trained in and I help couples with. Uh, despite a lot of training out there, these therapies, whether it's CBT or EMDR, uh, they don't necessarily introduce a person to discuss the topic of meaning in therapy whether we're dealing with depression, anxiety, OCD, PTSD, or addictions, uh, therapists are not classically trained to discuss this, what Frank would call the existential vacuum. Today we're going to learn about how to address this with people if your clients are just individuals. Let me just give you uh, three cases um, that uh, I've encountered. I've, I've greatly... Um, hidden the identities of these people, just general characteristics I put together. A woman named Sarah in her 40s who came to me. Uh, she lost both her parents in a, in a tragic car accident a few years before she came to me. She was suffering from uh, depression, panic attacks, uh, uh, sleeplessness. And uh, she came to me because she had been to therapy before, but she wanted to know more about why, the whys of life, the, the meaninglessness of her parents' death. Um, another woman named Miriam, a uh, 28-year-old woman with three children who suffered from postpartum depression after her second child was born prematurely and she spent many months in the hospital with him. Uh, she had suffered from a long history of you know, panic attacks, general anxiety disorder. She also wanted uh, a therapy which talked more about meaning and perhaps even spirituality. And then there's Moshe, a 35-year-old uh, man who came to me who um, had certain internet addictions and suffered from uh, OCD uh, and uh, panic attacks. And he was also kind of, as I spoke to him, uh, struggling with what was the real meaning in his life, what was the purpose of his life. So many of the classic therapies, however, um, are not enough in terms of addressing what Frank will call a neurological neurosis or neurosis based upon the lack of meaning in their lives. And one of the things we notice as psychologists who've been out in the field for a while is that there's two types of people that come to you, two types of presentations. Often you'll see uh, what we call, let's say, a situational depression versus a chronic depression. Situational depression is uh, somebody failed a test or somebody got fired from work and they go through a period of depression, which could last weeks, months, a uh, year or so, but they kind of move on from that, that trauma. That's more situational. Then we have what I call chronic uh, symptoms. You have somebody that's been suffering with depression, uh, lack of energy, um, somebody has a lot of anxiety symptoms since they were a child, or they have OCD, and it's just going on and on and on. Those are two very different types of presentations. And I would suggest to everyone that when we deal with what we call more, those more chronic types of situations, therapy, as most people practice today, whether using the CBT or the EMDR or the attachment focus, uh, many of those therapies are lacking somewhat in that they're not addressing that essential drive, what Viktor Frankl noted, as a will to meaning. And I'm not the only one, and Frankl's not the only one, to recognize this. There's a uh, woman named Margaret Werenberg. She wrote an article called Breaking Free from the Cure Myth. And she basically states that, um, that people that suffer from depression and anxiety may suffer it from it or with it 
for a very long period in the life or perhaps their entire lives. But what they need, however, is what she says is a daily program of meditation uh, and spiritual connection, what Frank will call a deepening or deepened sense of meaning in their lives. Why did psychology get to this point where we're not addressing this drive for meaning? And how do we kind of correct it? Well, if you look at this diagram, you'll see on the left side that classic psychology tends to deal with um, uh, a person's past. You look at the left side of the slide, you'll see at the bottom the word past. At the right side, you'll see future. But above that on the left, you'll see things like drives. Freudian psychiatry dealt more with a person's id, um, is will to pleasure, the pleasure principle. Um, Adler dealt with uh, a person's, fr a child's frustrated drive for power in their life. And therefore, these psychologies tend to point people to look more at their past to resolve what Freud would call the edible, edible complex and so on. And Adler would help people overcome uh, their sense of powerlessness in their relationships in society. Or we look at per people's experiences. Uh, what was it like being rejected? Uh, maybe being bullied in school, for example, was a very formative thing for many young people that may feel they're bullied later on in life from their jobs. And of course, we look backwards with a lot of people into their traumas. We want to know um, if they've experienced physical, sexual, uh, sexual trauma. And we kind of go back and we kind of heal those traumas. But whatever we're dealing with mostly in psychology, however, seems to be mostly based in their past. But let's move towards the right of the slide and we'll see as we move from the self on the top left towards the top right, we move towards what we call nuos. Nuos is a, just a Latin word meaning meaning. Uh, and in, in the world of meaning in psychology, we want to deal with things like a person's values, a person's goals, their attitudes, their current relationships and loving and giving to other people. Again, classic psychology deals more with the past. Frankel and logotherapy, however, takes us more into the future. Now, besides the past, we know there's also a psychology of the present. And in the present, a lot of psychologists work today in something called mindfulness. They're trying to help people think about thinking. They're watching, uh, helping a person watch their own thoughts and kind of dissociating from them. But what is lacking in classic psychoanalytic ther therapy or theory and other therapies, including CBT, EMDR, and others, or even mindfulness, which focuses one in just, so to speak, the present, we're missing this focus on the future, which is indeed what logotherapy talks about. Frankel Logotherapy is all about the future. And let's uh, actually take a look at another video. This one about Viktor Frankl speaking about the need to go higher than oneself. They wish to make a lot of money. In Europe, every American student, if more every American adult, is regarded as someone who is just out to make a lot of money. Really, 16%, 16% of these students regarded their main goal and concern in life to make a lot of money. I'm quoting literally, make a lot of money. And you know what the top class, the top category, we say category, category, what do you say? Category was among, you excuse me, but uh, I know I am speaking a marvelous accent without the slightest English. Now, <laughs> You know, you know what the top category was? 78% of these American youngsters were concerned as they expressed it themselves with finding a meaning and purpose in their lives. So this is a realistic, a realistic view on man. And you know, You won't believe it, gray, uh, gray hair, my age, I started taking flying lessons recently. Do you know what my flying instructor told me? If you are starting here, wish to get here, say east, heading for this, and you have a crosswind, you will drift and you will land here, so you have to do what we pilots call 
A crabbing, he told me. C R A B, crabbing. You have to head for north of this uh, uh, airfield air and you have to fly that way, you see, as if you headed in this direction. If you are heading here above this airfield, then you will actually land here. But if you head for here, you are landing here. This holds also for man, I would say. If we, if we take man as he really is, we make him worse. But if we overestimate him, it's premature your applause, you will soon know why. If we, if we seem to be idealists and are overestimating, overrating man, and looking at him that high, here above. You know what happens? We promote him to what he really can be. So we have to be idealists in a way, because then we wind up as the true, the real realists. And you know who has said this? If we take man as he is, we make him worse. But if we take man as he should be, we make him capable of becoming what he can be, this was not my flight instructor, this was not me, this was Goethe. He said this verbally. And now you will understand why I in one of my writings once said, this is the most apt maxim and motto for any psychotherapeutic activity. So if you don't recognize a young man's will to meaning, man's search for meaning. You make him worse, you make him dull, you make him frustrated, you still add and contribute to his frustration. While if you presuppose in this man, if in this so-called criminal or juvenile delinquent or drug abuse and so forth, there must be a, a what we call spark, yeah? a spark of search for meaning. Let's recognize this. Let's presuppose it. And then you will elicit it from him and you will make him become what he in principle is capable of becoming. So what that means is we need a therapy which addresses both sides of man. Not just his past or his present, but also his future. And that's what Frankl said. We're not trying to discount the importance of CBT, psychoanalysis, and Lyrian psychology, EMDR, and so on. What he believed was that logotherapy is not a replacement for that psychotherapy, but it completes psychotherapy. And therefore, we'll now understand uh, the importance of uh, introducing the topic of meaning to our clients and to people around us, or even to ourselves. Um, most psychologists, they are trained to do something called an intake when they, see their, uh, when they meet a client in their office. An intake would include uh, the person's history, uh, family issues, um, developmental issues, if there's any drug abuse or drug use, various traumas, and basic medical conditions which may be uh, affecting their emotional well-being. But those intakes, which we all do, whether we're social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, or doctors, those are all about the past, that intake when we do that is then setting up the discussion for then going back and, so to speak, exploring and rectifying the past. I'd like to suggest, as Logotherapy does, we introduce something else. We do another intake. And one intake was created by a Logotherapist named Crumbaugh. He created something called the Purpose in Life Test. It's very easy to get and it's for free online. Google the word Purpose in Life Test by Crumbaugh. And a test will come up of many different questions. But it's a very interesting test. The test is a test on meaningfulness or meaninglessness. And all these questions have a scale between 1 and 5. For example, the first question would be, I am usually, on the left towards the number 1 is bored. We go up to number 5 to the right, enthusiastic. So if a person is terribly bored, they put a 1. If they're incredibly enthusiastic, they put a 5. Or if they feel somewhere kind of in between, they make a 2, 3, or 4. Question number 2. Life seems to me, to the left, routine, towards the one, or towards five, to the right, always exciting. Question number three. In life I have, to the left, no goals at one, or clear goals and aims at five. Four, 
my personal existence is, to the left, towards number one, utterly meaningless, or towards number five, to the right, as totally meaningful. Those are just four examples, but I suggest you look at this purpose in life test. Now, I try to administer this test with many of my clients. On top of the initial historical intake, I also introduce the purpose in life test. What does that really do? What it does, it sets up the stage that in therapy, we're not going to just be discussing their past. We're going to be discussing their future. We're going to want to know about uh, their purpose in life and what type of goals um, they could acquire in their lives. One very, uh, very easy way to do this is uh, another sheet we give out. Um, and the, the, the question on top is, I wanted to be a fill in the blank. So a person may say, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a scientist. I wanted to be a rabbi. I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be a psychologist, a speech therapist. Uh, I wanted to build homes or cars or whatever. So they fill in the blank and they say, what are the possible reasons that, let's say, I wanted to be a psychologist? So we'd say, well, it involves helping people. But to the right of that, we put, and what are the values? The values would be helping people. Um, another possible reason for being a psychiatrist or a psychologist is that it changes people's lives. So what would be the value of the ability to transform other people's lives? It's a tremendous, tremendous thing. Um, or we could say uh, some psychologists do research. So they would put one of their possible reasons for doing it is they, uh, the importance of doing research, and the value would be research and expanding human knowledge in the world. That's just one, one example. The next slide, we talk about some of the values that people find in their lives. I just listed a few. Um, some people will hold on to values and believe they're very important, like authenticity, compassion, honesty, um, autonomy, balance, community, citizenship, kindness, humor, or influence. You can just Google uh, lists of values online and find there's hundreds of different values which people hold to be very important in their lives. And they could uh, talk about them if a per person wanted to be a teacher. So one of the possible reasons is um, you know, helping young people learn. And the value would be early childhood education, expanding people's knowledge. So knowledge would be a value for that person. Uh, a teacher might also suggest that the possible reason is because they want to be a good role model. So um, perhaps their value would be that, that they would represent are things like citizenship or influence or balance that they're teaching to other people. So we have them, we talk to them a lot about working through some of the things they wanted in their lives or still want now, and to identify the values associated with those professions. We also look at, um, when we're talking with somebody, we have a questionnaire, we'll say, well, what type of hobbies are meaningful to you? So someone could say, you know, um, you know playing music is meaningful. And so in the value, the value could be things like um, uh, practicing hard at something and achieving uh, value could be making people happy. Uh, uh, you could have a value of being inspirational. So inspiring others is an important value in a person's life. We talk about their present job. What are the values in their job which they believe to be important? Um, working hard. Diligence might be somebody, somebody's value. Um, helping improve other people's lives in their work could be an important value for a person. Um, experiences they've had, whether they've been to a great shiur, uh, they've, they've uh, read a, a great sefer, they want to share the insight about the sefer, um, about the values that they read about, or, or things they experienced at, at a uh, fabringen or something of importance in their lives. That's also what we talk about, experiential values. And finally, people. Uh, we, I often ask a person, um, can you talk about some people in your life that you've met or haven't met or read about or watched videos about that represented certain uh, incredible values like leadership and education and kindness and community. So once we start doing that, we've already introduced in therapy, we're now also talking about values. And once we're on that topic, once they fill out some of these sheets, um, I get them to kind of like um, add up how many times they've repeated their values. They've, they've mentioned kindness uh, maybe seven times within the profession as a teacher they wanted as a child or uh, they wanted to, uh, or they, they looked at other people in the community and noted that they were people of exceptional, that represented exceptional kindness with others. So a person could add up, let's say, seven times they mentioned the word kindness, or knowledge four times, or spirituality uh, five times is important value. 
Not only that, we then help them make a hierarchy. Now that you've listed your values, uh, now you can make your hierarchy. I, I chose some other examples. One person I worked with uh, chose trust to be his first value, and then helping others, and then authenticity. And now the discussion again becomes, what are your priorities in life? What's important to you? What are your values? And what are you going to carry out in your life? We often make a one-month, one-year, and five-year plan with somebody. We say, OK, if these are your values, so over the next month, um, you know, which values are you going to try to actualize and to utilize over a one-year plan? What's important to you in terms of your values? What will you actually carry out? And over the next five years, what type of values are important to you that you'd like to fulfill? And then we do a, there's a logotherapy technique where we, uh, we, we talk about death, actually, and say, if, God forbid, somebody would, would die in one month, one year, or in five years, only had so much time left, well, what values would they work on the most? What would a person be doing if their time was limited in this world? What it does is it, it focuses deeply on squeezing out, so to speak, um, a person's real essential values, and now uh, try to really carry them out in their lives as, as best as possible. And some of the questions we ask with clients are, you know, what are your lifelong aims, ambitions, and goals? Um, what do you see as the meaning of life? What creative skills or activities bring the person meaning in life? What's stopping you from becoming the person you want to become or actualizing the values you want to actualize? And finally, which relationships um, in your life can you actualize? And in what ways would you like to actualize your spiritual potentials? Is something like uh, praying more, davening more, or meditating, or performing various acts of kindness important to you? Uh, these are discussions we have in logotherapy. And that's kind of the beginning. So in therapy, therefore, we're not just discussing their pain and their traumas, which we do. We also add on to what would you like to become in the future. It's a discussion of value. People find this extremely satisfying because often what happens when you're suffering from depression and anxiety is you become your problems. It's always your thoughts about yourself. It's about your obsessions. It's about your feelings of worthlessness. Um, and in therapy, we can talk about those feelings even more. But when we introduce logotherapy, the other half, we're now talking about them choosing, evaluating and choosing their values. It's an extremely uh, redemptive and meaningful experience as well. The other main thing that we do in logotherapy is talk about suffering. As I mentioned before, um, some people have situational depression, anxiety, or PTSD, other people have much more chronic problems. And there's no question about that. Somebody who's dealing with depression for a significant time in their life is really suffering. You know, just to juxtapose a little bit like what Viktor Frankl went through, you know, in, in the camps. He believed that um, that would be his third value is when, when a person is facing inescapable suffering, the, the last freedom left is their, uh, their attitude towards their suffering, how they react to it, despite what they're going through. And of course, Franco believes that if a person could get a greater sense of meaning of why they're suffering, or what could be the possible value of their suffering, they're able to cope with their suffering more effectively. Now, I and, and most therapists, you know, we have no idea why a person suffers. Who can say why? Uh, people die or people suffer from terrible illnesses or depression and anxiety. And I don't think it's fair of us to even, you know, suggest we know because we just don't know. Tzadikim know, Kaddish Baruch who knows, we don't, we don't really know. But what we can do, however, is enter into what we call a logotherapeutic dialogue with somebody, a Socratic discussion about suffering. And... Um, uh, let's take a look at this next video and see how Frankel discussed suffering and meaning in his life. Dr. Frankel, what is the difference between people who are able to pick themselves up, get over life's problems, and those who are not? The decisive factor is decision, the freedom to, of choice, the freedom to come up with a decision. It should be, I would like to become this way or another in spite of conditions that should only seem to fully determine my behavior. I wish to act freely as a responsible being, which is a human being. I wish to act 
in accord with heredity and environment, using, owing what I become to them, but also, if need be, in spite of the worst conditions. That, uh, this is exactly what you could watch and witness under severe, extreme conditions of strength, uh, of, of stress, or of uh, or tragic conditions. Just think of uh, people uh, living for several years under the worst conditions of a prisoner of war camp. There is a whole body of, of, uh, of psychiatric literature about that, or for that matter, in concentration camps. And this is what should be acknowledged. People are free. And if you watch or study the lives of such people in just a detached, down-to-earth, empirical, strictly empirical, scientific way and fashion, other, in another way than you presented it and you commented it in another way, then people get the picture, the impression of a human being as something, not someone, something that is fully determined, whereas they don't recognize and acknowledge the freedom and the responsibility, the responsibility for themselves, the responsibility for making something or someone out of himself. So your basic philosophy is that life has meaning under all conditions, but how easy is it when there's a sense of hopelessness, a sense of despair, to recognize this meaning? Let me present you, confront you with a somewhat uh, strange definition of despair. As I'm used to uh, proclaiming is that despair uh, can be explained in terms of a mathematical equation. D, capital D, equals S minus M. What does it mean? Despair is suffering without meaning. As long as an individual cannot find, cannot see any meaning in his or her despair, he or she will certainly be prone to, in its suffering, I wanted to say, no meaning in the suffering. He or she will, uh, her will certainly be prone to despair and, under certain conditions, to suicide. But at the moment they can see a meaning in their suffering, they can mold it into an achievement, into a, they can mold their predicament into an accomplishment on the human level. They can turn their tragedies into a personal triumph but they must know for what, what should I do with it. But if people like so many segments of present day society and population cannot find any meaning whatsoever in their lives, cannot see anything meaningful, they more often than not have uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, something to live by, uh, I'll say at least enough to live by, they cannot see anything to live for. What is the answer to the question, why me? Why did this happen to me? The uh, answer to such a question is nothing that a psychiatrist or any other type of a scientist <coughs> can come up. But I would not uh, share the opinion of, say, Jean Paul Sartre, who said we have to accept and uh, to shoulder courageously, heroically, the absolute meaninglessness of our lives. But what I think is rather that what we have to accept is the incapacity of, uh, our, uh, of our humanness, the incapacity to recognize the ultimate meaning in intellectual or merely rational terms. This is the only thing we have to accept. But still we may believe in a, in ultimate meaning, but to, to uh, lead someone, say a patient, to, uh, to eat the way for him to such a belief, to faith, is of course not the business or job to be carried out by a psychiatrist, but rather by a theologian. Tell me, to what extent do you feel we have choices 
in the things that befall us. Our freedom is a finite freedom, a limited freedom. That is to say, a human being is never fully free from conditions, be they of biological or psychological or sociological uh, kind. But the ultimate freedom is always and remains always reserved to ourselves. That is the freedom to take a stand to whatever conditions might confront us. How we react to the unchangeable conditions is up to ourselves. In other words, if we cannot change a situation, we have always the last freedom to change our attitude to that situation. Dr. Frankel, give me an example of meaning that can be taken out of a situation of despair. I once received a letter from a young Taxan uh, student who told me his own story. At the age of 17 years, he had an accident when uh, uh, indulging to his drive, uh, diving sport. And from that time on, he was paralyzed from the neck down. And he wrote to me, I broke my neck, but it did not break me. I am at present helpless, and this handicap will remain with myself apparently forever. But I have not given up my studies. I went because of my own helplessness to help other people. I want to become a psychologist to help others. And I'm sure he wrote to me that my suffering will add an essential contribution to my ability to understand others and to help other people. This man, three, three years later, was invited by me to deliver a lecture, to read a paper, at the third World Congress of Logotherapy taking place at the University uh, of Regensburg in West Germany. He was brought in and with his wheelchair by a plane from Texas to West Germany and delivered a lecture under the title The Defiant Power of the Human Spirit. And the last sentence read, I know that this is true because that man was me. So with that in mind, let's see how to utilize this in therapy or for ourselves with others. So the way we do this is we just begin discussing possible meanings for, for suffering in a person's life and ask questions like this. Have you ever seen anything good come out of a seemingly hopeless situation? And believe it or not, people do see that sometimes they went through a difficult period in their life, but in the end it was, in some way was good, it was directing them in a new direction. Um, have there ever been times in your life when you have been instructed to do something you didn't want to do, but in the end find out that it was actually good for you? A very related question, but it does trigger a lot of good discussion. Did experiencing a difficult time in your life ever make you stronger? Using your imagination, could you write a story about how a person may experience something initially as painful, but in the end it saved their life. Some other questions. Is it possible that since God gave man free will to make his own decisions, this implies that he can do both good or bad things in the world? Or is there any possible good that emerged from your own traumas? These are some of the powerful questions we discuss therapeutically with somebody. And instead of us kind of like pretending to know why something happened, through this dialogue, we introduce the possibility that there may be some meaning in their suffering. Of course, we don't know the ultimate meaning. That's for God to know. But we can, however, as human beings, rise up a little bit beyond ourselves and see from a more broader perspective, perhaps, how certain amount of suffering did have some meaning. Of course, there's type of suffering that will never understand meaning. But there are different levels in between that gray area that we could increase. And I have to tell you, when I've done this with people, people feel so relieved that they can look back 
and kind of reframe what they've been through. You know, I have this, uh, this is term post-traumatic stress disorder, right? But I learned from a wonderful uh, a therapist once, we can also call it post-traumatic uh, success. It doesn't have to be stress, it can also be success. Person can indeed overcome um, tremendous loss in life and even find meaning in it, even though it's very difficult. What Frankel calls it, he calls it, to squeeze out uh, some meaning from it will itself be um, incredibly invigorating, um, incredibly uh, healing for a person to at least tempt a discussion towards finding meaning. What it comes out, therefore, is, is that we need to balance both therapy and logotherapy, as my diagram shows. We have to go back, but we also have to move towards the future with our clients. One other great thing I want to mention, uh, a diagram I utilize a lot with my clients, is that um, there's always a certain amount of freedom a person has. Frankel would say that we all have, uh, we're all conditioned or we are all limited by certain genetic or environmental factors we can't uh, necessarily change. Sometimes we do have uh, more freedom to choose, but sometimes we'd we be faced with uh, what Frank will call inescapable suffering. And he says that even while faced, even while the Jews were facing the Nazis in the camps and they would take away everything from them, whether it was um, you know, their possessions, their family members, their manuscripts, their jewelry, their clothing, their wealth, whatever they would take from them, there was still one freedom they had was their attitude towards their suffering. That's the one thing Frankl says no one, even the Nazis in Machshimam, could take away from them. And he had this great quote many years ago. He said like this, between stimulus and response, there's a space. If you just look at that diagram, between stimulus and response, there's that space. Stimulus means like this. Somebody pushes you. Let's take a childhood example. Somebody pushes you in the playground and you push him back and you go, both get pulled down to the principal's office. So when the child gets a little older, he'll hopefully learn that when somebody pushes you, it doesn't mean you have to push back. If we take the classical model, many people think between stimulus and response, there is no space. You know, it's a hard world out there. You get pushed, you have to push back. Force has to be met with more force. But Franklin says, no, real human dignity comes from creating space between stimulus and the response of stimulus. So, for example, instead of when somebody pushes you, you push back. When you have that space between you and the person, you think of other ways of responding. So you may uh, use your words to tell them not to do that. You may go to the principal and talk to your, your principal to have the principal talk to that person. Um, there's many things a person can do. And you don't have to necessarily respond to stimulus. It's like uh, a very big question is how do you actually do that? So if you look at the bottom of the screen, um, there are actually uh, some ways. I, I mentioned this is a bit from Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits, as well, who quotes Frankel uh, as well. But here are some things which he mentions, and I think they're very powerful. And I do share this with clients that come to my office, and we, we show them this slide, and we, we talk about ways to do this. How do you broaden that space between stimulus and response? Well, here are some ways. Um, conscience, imagination, or will. Conscience means um, when I think if it's right or wrong to respond. So if somebody pushes me, is it really right or wrong to push back? Maybe there's um, uh, other ways I, I could do that. But for sure, if I hit him back, um, am I actually justified in doing so? That's my conscience. That's just one example. But you can think of hundreds of examples in your life when somebody bothers you or somebody uh, takes something from you. Is it right to fight them back? Is it right to hurt them? You could go to court. You can do all types of things. In a civilization which believes in peacefulness, there's ways of addressing uh, wrongdoing. It's not necessarily stealing from them in return. Conscience. Imagination. The human being has been endowed with a tremendous power of imagination. I ask my clients to think, well, what other ways could you possibly respond? Perfect example in parenting. When a child um, is out of control, he's potching his or her sis sister or brother or, or, or damaging something in the house. So sometimes a parent, of course, when there's no space between stimulus and response, will unfortunately give the kid a potch. So there's no space there, right? Stimulus was a kid doing something naughty. Response was the potch. 
But I ask people to think about using their imagination. Are there other ways they can respond? There's many other ways they can respond. One great technique would be giving a kid a timeout or giving them uh, a warning. If you do that three times, uh, you're going to be warned, but after the third time, you're going to have a timeout and go to your room. There's going to be a consequence. So a consequencing and a timeout is using one's imagination to respond differently. And last but not least is uh, utilizing our sense of will. And this is really the key, as I conclude today, with all of Frankl's psychology, is man's will. It's will to meaning, but it's also man's will. Will is extremely powerful. Frankl, uh, in, his, in Man's Search for Meaning and other places, said that despite the conditions, I behave in a certain way. I utilize what, what he calls, what one calls the freedom of will at that moment. Uh, a person would share uh, a morsel of bread, his last morsel of bread with somebody in the camps. A person um, would uh, spend more time talking to somebody who lost their family members who was about to commit suicide and, and share a good word with them. Um, that's where I'm able to utilize my, my free will. That's unfortunately in the concentration camps. But in all things, I ask people to consider this. Despite your depression, despite your OCD, despite your anxiety, you can still choose to actualize your values. It might be painful, so to speak, feeling all that depression or anxiety. But despite it, the depression and anxiety, um, you could choose to be friendly to people. It's not that it, it removes the depression and anxiety, but as I mentioned before, dealing with a chronic condition which may not go away, I can behave in, in congruence with my, my values and I utilize my will to carry these important things out in my life. So just, just to conclude, logotherapy has many practical implications. Um, one of the uh, great ways of just helping people with logotherapy, as with my clients as well, is simply reading chapters or stanzas or quotes from, from Viktor Frankl. Uh, we've had some wonderful discussions with people on issues of suffering or um, issues of depression by just taking out some Frankl and say, okay, let's, let's kind of just read this together and, and what do you think? What do you think Frankl means and how, do you, how did you experience that in your life or maybe you didn't experience it? Uh, these logotherapeutic conversations, as I mentioned, based upon some of the principles and hands out I showed you today, or even using Frankl's writings, I think are extremely helpful. And I hope but today you've realized how to utilize this in therapy with your clients or as individuals with people that you love in your life.